Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, uh, as everyone said, it's, uh, it truly is so nice to be here. And um, my uh, congratulations and, and compliments again to Joanne and her entire team for uh, m making this happen. Um, I, I was hoping that we would uh, do some singing, so I hope that you're interested and willing and whatever to do some singing. And uh, let me just uh, start by saying that uh, this, uh, th this topic uh, is, is interesting and different and vast at all at the same time. Um, when I founded the uh, Nathaniel <coughs> Debt Chorale some uh, uh, 15 years ago, we're just coming to the end of our 14th performance season, uh, I started to use the term Afrocentric choral music. And um, I said that we would, uh, I said that we would do, um, we would do certain things. And um, uh, our mission statement, or our vision is to be a, a premier performer of Afrocentric composers, a touchstone for education of audiences regarding the full spectrum of Afrocentric choral music. And our mission is to build bridges of understanding, appreciation, and acceptance between communities of people through the medium of music, and particularly Afrocentric choral music. So people keep asking me, what does that mean? And what is Afrocentric choral music? So um, we've been trying to sort of define this over the years a little bit. I, um, I love it. I use the, um, I use the term, I used the term, and I started to use the term because I did not want to say that the chorale would, um, would perform the music of black composers or composers of a African uh, origin. I, I wanted a larger sandbox in which to play. And I was aware that there were many people who weren't of African uh, uh, descent and or black that have uh, composed music and responded to the African heritage traditions from around the world. And so I wanted to be able to do a little bit of that. Um, so I'm just going to pop back and forth between some of these things. Uh, if you're willing, let's, um, let's, let, let's, let's sing a little bit. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll come and go from singing to speaking and whatever. Um, I, ha I have put this, uh, this little booklet together. Uh, there are only two pieces in there that are complete and entire because I could do that. And those were two pieces by Nathaniel Dett. The rest are partial pieces so that if you want them, you will need to uh, go to the publisher or call me uh, or email me. All right. um, but the first, uh, the first two pieces are two examples of, um, of spirituals that, that we have done in our repertoire. And I'm essentially focusing on the repertoire that we've we've done over the last 14 years. Um, this first spiritual is an arrangement by uh, Dr. Wendell Whalen. I don't know if, uh, how many people are familiar with him or not, um, but he uh, used to be the head of uh, choral activity at uh, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where Dr. Martin Luther King and um, uh, Spike Lee and uh, several others have uh, come out of that wonderful college. And uh, this piece focuses on Mary and on our, um, our relationship with her as, as a person who would have borne a lot, seen a lot happen to her loved ones and, uh, and uh, lived with that experience. And for a lot of men and women of African heritage uh, who created the spirituals, this was something that was, you know, um, very uh, visceral and germane to them, this, this experience of dealing with a lot of heartache and heartbreak. Um, <coughs> if I have an adventurous uh, soprano soloist, uh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Whoever would like to sort of uh, lead that out, or we can all say a lot. Here we go. And. Who was a little slower than that? Sorry. Here we go. And. Oh. 
you guys know this piece? No. Oh. <laughs> this is what I love about what I do. It's just, <laughs> it's, just it's, it's so fun just sharing music. Well, now for something a little bit different. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, is a light shining in the heavens, Robert L. Morris. Um, and he lives in the uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota area. Wonderful, wonderful composer and arranger of all kinds of music. Um, he, he does a lot of gospel music. He does, um, you know, everything from these kinds of spirituals to um, really uh, contemporary, very challenging uh, music. Um, you have as part of the handout um, the, the better part of the repertoire that we've done over the last 14 years. And when you, uh, when you, come, to, when you come to his name, uh, one of the pieces there, and the angel spoke. A real challenge, but uh, well, well, well worth it. Anyway, um, let's, uh, let's do a little bit of reading of this one. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit more rhythmic, and um, we, just, uh, we just sang this on Saturday at, um, at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto for uh, a new benefit. <coughs> Um, I don't know whether uh, folks here are aware of our, our left, retired Lieutenant General uh, Romeo Dallaire in, in Canada, who, um, who uh, witnessed the uh, genocide in Rwanda and has started an initiative to, uh, to, to, to bring child soldiers out of Africa. But a lot of them are coming to Canada and falling between the cracks. And so um, there was another initiative started, uh, launched by Benefit on Saturday to, um, to come up with money to, to educate and to save them, to make sure that they don't leave one, one horror in Africa and come to another horror on the streets of uh, Toronto. And uh, what I love about uh, and why I picked this piece was we get to a certain section in it which says, I come this night, I come to fight. I bring no weapons, I bring light. I think that's a pretty powerful uh, tool with which to work. Anyway, let's, uh, let's, give, it a, let's give it a shot. Two, three, and light is the Lord. Thank you. 
He's a wonderful, wonderful arranger. He's, a, he's an amazing arranger. So, we um, spirituals obviously make up a large part of, of the repertoire that we do. It's not the only thing that we do. And because of who and what, we, uh, you know, what we've set ourselves at to do, um, we're constantly having to define ourselves, which is part of what Afrocentrism is all about. But I wanted to share a, a poem with you um, to let you understand why we feel spirituals are so important. I don't know if, uh, if uh, the name James Weldon Johnson is known to you. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know who James Weldon Johnson is, go look him up. He is, he's major, really, truly major. And um, he, he wrote the, this poem as part of the introduction to the anthology of uh, the, uh, the American Negro Spiritual. When it was first published, it was f published in two volumes. I think Dover has it now with both volumes together. And this poem uh, that I'm about to read to you is, is part of the, uh, the initial introduction. Uh, James Weldon Johnson was, um, um, he, he was the secretary of the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored uh, People um, for many, many years and actually started the marches that Dr. King later became known for and, uh, and, and the nonviolent protests. Uh, he was U.S. Consul to, uh, to uh, Venezuela and to Nicaragua as well, to, um, among many other things. Anyway, this poem is, is called O Black and Unknown Bards of Long Ago. O Black and Unknown Bards of Long Ago how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How, in your darkness, did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first, from midst his bonds, lifted his eyes? Who first, from out the still watch, lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark-kept soul, burst into song? Heart of what slave poured out such melody as, steal away to Jesus? On its strains, his spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. Who heard great Jordan roll? Whose starward eye saw a chariot swing low? And who was he that breathed that comforting melodic sigh? Nobody knows the trouble I see. What merely living clod, what captive thing could up to it God through all its darkness grope and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith, and hope? How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music heard not with the ears? How sound the elusive reed so seldom blown, which stirs the soul or melts the heart to tears? Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation ever heard a theme nobler than go down Moses. Mark its bars, how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood. Such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds. Such tones there were that helped make history when time was young. There is a wide, wide wonder in it all that from degraded rest and servile toil the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil. O oh, black slave singers, gone, forgot, unfamed, you, you alone of all the long, long line of those who've sung untaught, unknown, unnamed, have stretched out upward seeking the divine. You sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, no chant of bloody war, no exulting paean of arms won triumphs, but your humble strings you touched in chord with music empyrean. You sang far better than you knew, the songs that for your singers' hungry hearts, for your listeners' hungry hearts sufficed, still live. Let me read that line again. The songs that for your listeners' hungry hearts sufficed, still live. But more than this to you belongs. You sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. 
I can't, I, I could not express why the spiritual might, might be as powerful, as impactful, as still used and still built upon um, in, you know, any, any better than this. I mean, those are amazing words. Um, Nathaniel Dett, uh, for whom I named my ensemble, uh, picked up on this theme. And um, he actually said something which, uh, which we found equally compelling and, uh, and powerful uh, when we thought about doing, again, what we said we would do. He was an ardent collector of, uh, do you guys know who Nathaniel Dett is? Mm -hmm. uh, some of you don't, but uh, uh, let me read what he said and then I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about him. Um, he was an ardent collector of Negro folk, uh, folk music, uh, which he used to great advantage, and he states, we have this wonderful store of folk music, the melodies of an enslaved people. That's important that he said this how many years ago. Part of Afrocentricity and Afrocentrism is self-definition and redefining and reclaiming through many mediums what it means to be who one is. And in this particular case, what it means to be of African origin. Um, so, still, I hear so many folks speak about the music of the slaves, or refer to, you know, and so the slaves did this, and the, these, these, you know, and when I, when I first read this, I thought, how enlightened, because that's not who they were, that's something that was done to them. So when he says, we have this wonderful store of folk music, the melody of an enslaved people. But this store will be of no value unless we utilize it, unless we treat it in such manner that it can be presented in choral form, in lyric and operatic works, in concertos and suites and salon music, unless our musical architects take the loose timber of Negro themes and fashion from it music which will prove that we too have national feelings and characteristics as have the European peoples whose forms we have zealously followed for so long. And then he proceeded to do a bunch of that stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll read a couple of his pieces in a moment. Nathaniel Dett um, is rightly claimed by my American brothers and sisters because he lived and worked in the United States for the majority of his, of his life. But he was born and raised and uh, had his early education in what we now know as Niagara Falls, Ontario in Canada. And... Um, and uh, he was the first black man to graduate from Oberlin with, uh, with an undergrad degree in piano, organ, and composition, and uh, distinguished himself in so many different ways. I mean, he is the quintessential Renaissance uh, uh, man. <coughs> and um, he kept his relationship with Canada. We're very pleased about that. And uh, when he died of a heart attack in 1943 in Battle Creek, Michigan, his body was returned to Ontario to be buried alongside his mother and his uh, two older brothers, so he's ours too. So I've named him uh, Canadian American. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, let's uh, let, let's uh, let, let's uh, return to the music and uh, look at a couple of his um, pieces. And maybe in the essence of time, we may not sing them all the way through. But um, here we go. Oh, holy Lord. This piece was actually written and dedicated to what is now known. Um, it says the Elgar, the Elgar Choir. It's now called the Bach Elgar Choir in uh, just outside of Toronto, and was first performed in 1906 at a Field of Honor memorial service for Canadians fallen in battle. Oh, holy! Lord.
so forth. Beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, let's jump ahead to uh, Go Not Far From Me, O oh God. Det uh, was, uh, was a master of composition, and uh, a lot of his singers didn't like him very much for, for the challenges that uh, he, he offered them. And uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of these pieces. I can tell you how many sopranos kind of go, he didn't do that. <laughs> well, yes, he did. You know, um, like so many of the uh, famous American composers, he found his way to the studio of uh, Nadia Boulanger in Paris and um, studied, studied with her. She actually uh, said of him, um, I didn't really teach him anything. He already had such a command of the language. We merely had conversation. You know? um, and uh, Tim, you uh, referenced uh, the Cincinnati May Festival. Um, <coughs> Death's major oratorio based on uh, uh, Godin Moses, called The Ordering of Moses, was first performed at the Cincinnati May Festival and conducted by Eugene Goossens, who was liked at a, a student of Nadia Boulanger's in Paris. Um, at a time in Cincinnati when uh, the black-white divide was, was huge, uh, there's still some concerns there, but uh, this is why we keep doing what we do. Go not far. It needs a good uh, tenor baritone, high baritone solo. towards the end, because he actually sort of, um, with this piece, um, put two uh, spiritual themes together. So let's jump to um, page nine of the work. Um, we've changed keys, now, oh, now to be, and. Oh, now to be. how to bring it back in, into print. So I'm just, again, going to talk a little bit about <coughs> this term that I've been using, this Afrocentric term. Um, 
The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as emphasizing or promoting emphasis on African culture and the contributions of Africans to the development of Western civilization. Uh, Dr. Mulefi Kete Asante, who um, has done, he's the chair of the Department of African American Studies at Temple University, has written a lot about it, and he's sort of set himself as a target for other people who sort of try to define what this word is and what it means. And it's constantly changing. People are still trying to define it. But he says, as a cultural configuration, the Afrocentric idea is distinguished by five characteristics. One, an intense interest in psychological location as determined by symbols, motifs, rituals, and signs. Two, a commitment to finding the subject place of Africans in any social, political, economic, or religious phenomenon with implications for questions of sex, gender, and class. Three, a defense of African cultural elements as historically valid in the context of art, music, and literature. Four, a celebration of centeredness and agency, a commitment to lexical refinement that eliminates pejoratives about Africans or other people. And five, a powerful imperative from historical sources to revise the collective text of African people. So um, here's a slightly different take on it. Uh, Dr. Molana Karenga started a festival primarily for African Americans many years ago after the uh, uh, race riots in, uh, in Watts, in uh, California. And now this festival <coughs> has become Pan-African in, uh, in its scope and reach. Uh, the festival is called Kwanzaa, and we celebrate it from December the 26th until January the 1st. But really, the principles on which it is founded are meant to be lived by year-round. Kwanzaa builds on the five fundamental activities of continental African first fruit celebrations in gathering, reverence, commemoration, recommitment, and celebration. Kwanzaa then is a time of in gathering of the people to reaffirm the bonds between them, a time of special reverence for the Creator and creation and thanks and respect for the blessings, bountifulness, and beauty of creation a time for commemoration of the past in pursuit of its lessons and in honor of its models of human excellence, our ancestors. A time of recommitment to our highest cultural ideals in our ongoing effort to always bring forth the best of African cultural thought and practice and a time for celebration of the good, the good of life and, the, and of existence itself, the good of family, community and culture, the good of the awesome and the ordinary, in the word, in a word, the good of the divine, both natural and social. And so, um, the, there, there are seven principles uh, that, we, that we celebrate as well. Um, they're called the Nguzo Saba, seven principles. Umoja, Kujichagulia, Ujima, Ujama, Nia, Kuumba, and Imani. And they stand for principles of unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. And so these, we, are, we as, a, as an organization are still working with all these varying definitions to determine the kind of repertoire that we perform. So we just don't do any one thing. We try to do many things. Um, and we, we seek to inform and be educated by um, by the principal practitioners of the particular type of music before we ourselves turn around and endeavor to disseminate it. Um, and uh, one piece, uh, maybe we can look at the next uh, choral, um, choral bit. Uh, again, I don't know whether this is something that is familiar to, um, to people or not, but it's, it's, it's a work well worth looking at. Uh, Marie is uh, shaking her head. She knows this piece. It is, it is massive. It is, it is a choral masterpiece. And um, we're, we're still sinking our teeth into it. Uh, I don't think there is a, a, a contemporary recording of it to the best of my knowledge. There is, um, there is an, an older one that he did uh, with his choir many, many, many years ago. Um, but um, it's uh, Mr. Afro Brasileira and uh, by Carlos Alberto Pinto Fonseca. And uh, 
there are so many things we could tell you about it, uh, you know, but it, that would be a whole lecture on, onto, onto itself. It is based on Afro-Brazilian rhythms and lullabies. And uh, when, you, you know, when you approach the piece, you think, oh my goodness, he should have percussionists playing. And some people have done it with percussion, some people have done it with dance um, and stuff like this. But he's actually built in the percussion in the way in which you approach the piece. And, um, and he has used all those major percussive sections uh, using the uh, church Latin. And when it comes to the, uh, to the softer, gentler ideas, he has used the vernacular Portuguese to bring out the, um, the, the, uh, the, the lullabies and the uh, folk songs that come from the region in which he lived. So um, all those dotted rhythms are very, very percussive. Ki, ye, e, le, zo. And you have to punch each of them and, uh, like that. And when you turn the page, like like so. And then over top of that, then you have like senior but it's it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. Um, Maybe you get the idea. Maybe we don't need to sing it because <laughs> you uh, But it's just again one of those things that we have uh, we have set ourselves to do. Uh, over the over the course of our, our history, we've done an entire program of uh, of, of Ghanaian choral music. Uh, we've researched uh, a man you will see on there, Dr. Ephraim Amu, who was for um, Ghana very much what Nathaniel Det and others were for America. And so we did several of the pieces that came from his collection. And then we coupled the program with um, indigenous folk music, with a Ghanaian drum and dance ensemble. And you know, we performed barefooted and in ritual costume. And my goodness, I was taken outside of my own comfort zone because I was asked by the dance master to be the one to bring on the chant. And I kept getting it wrong. And, and one piece, one, one ritual in particular, because I just was so challenged with the rhythm of the gong kogui, you know, that uh, double cowbell. Low, high, high, hello, high, high, hello, high, 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 hello, high, you know, and I would keep bringing the chant in at the wrong bit, and the dancers would look over and get me nasty looks because they'd have to sort of change their feet, you know. But this is why we do it, to challenge ourselves, you know. Um, so we did a, a warrior's ritual called uh, a chagbekor. It says, and the, the, the choir responds, Agolo, so perge to Gia, Chabakov, Yao, Dago, Agoel, and Baoma, La Chabakov, Yo. You know, and we get into stuff like that. We had so much fun doing that. And then we did a wedding ritual called Gahu. Songs of Gahu. Gahu, eh, Gahu, eh, the Benami, no, Gahu, eh. And we put that together with stuff that sounds somewhat classical and all the rest of that. And so we just kind of get into that. And it's partly we learn the music, but as we learn the music, we also learn about the culture. We learn about its spirituality. We learn about what's at the heart of that. And then when we turn around and put it back up there, that's what we invite people to not just be entertained, um, but to really engage. Um, there are other composers who are not of, um, of African heritage who have done... Um, I'm just going to point you to uh, Set Me as a Seal Upon Thine Heart. We're not going to sing that either. Uh, that's Dr. Adolphus <coughs> Elstork. He lives here in uh, the United States and is perhaps the most prolific living African-American composer of all styles and all genres. Um, I want to sing a little bit of Make Me a World, and uh, Hillary knows this piece, and uh, we know and love the composer a lot. Her name is Ruth Watson Henderson. She is a white Canadian composer. Um, but in this regard, her, her creation is Afrocentric, because the poem that she chose to set to music uh, is the creation uh, poem going back again to James Weldon Johnson and a collection that he did called God's Trombones, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse Form. 
And this is the telling of the creation in a way that uh, a white audience would not first understand. But a black audience would get it big time. Big, big time. You know, um, for a lot of uh, indigenous folks, uh, nature and everything is, how do you say it, anthropophized? Uh, is that how you would say it? Yeah, so it takes on human characteristics and that type of stuff. So here you have a black minister who steps out here, and it's very different from what we would read in Genesis chapter 1, you know, and the evening and the morning were the first day, <laughs> and, then the, and, then the, you know, and then the evening and the morning were the second day. Here you have a minister who steps out and says, and God stepped out in space, and he looked around and said, or she looked around and said, we won't go into that, that's another conversation. But just know that I am so on that page, I cannot tell you. Anyway, and God looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. And if you've been enslaved, you would know what that looks like. Because it's not just the physical darkness, it's all darkness. And then if you're black, you'd get this as well. Then God smiled. And the light broke. <laughs> and black people would get that because they have been at the butt of that end so many times. But see, then you take it and you turn it around and you make it something beautiful. Because from the sparkle that came off those pearly whites, God created the light, rolled it around in his hand, set the sun a blazing in the heavens, and, and it goes on and goes on. And I remember when Ruth was writing this piece, she, she, would, she would keep calling me and she would say, Brainerd, t tell, me, tell me about, what, what does this mean here? Like, what, why would he say such a thing? And she said, it so took her out of her normal style of writing as to completely almost recreate what she would, what she would do. So um, let's just do, do the opening moments of it a little bit. And let's, jump, let's jump ahead, sorry. Let's just uh, take it from bar nine uh, in the essence of time. Yeah. stirs that wonderful pot. And again, we could spend a whole bunch of time dissecting this. Um, I've left you a little piece of uh, uh, Mary Lou Williams. Uh, if you don't know that name, again, please go and hunt around. She is, uh, there are several of us that are, uh, that are endeavoring to reclaim her music and bring it back in, into, uh, into practice. She was a contemporary of uh, Duke Ellington and uh, a major major pianist and composer, um, phenomenal music. And I brought, I did bring a few CDs with me. We actually have uh, our most recent CDs called Nguzo Saba, in which we do the Nguzo Saba Suite of Glenn Edward Burley. And we do um, these two pieces, uh, St. Martin de Porres, who is a black Peruvian saint, and a piece called Elijah. Um, but um, as we wrap up, I just want to say, um, Again, how, how vast a topic this is. I mean, we could talk about any aspect of it, and I just decided that I would talk a little bit about what Afrocentricity m uh, meant, is meaning, and will continue to mean uh, and become for, for us. 
Um, it is not just music of black composers. It is the music that has been inspired by the African uh, heritage traditions. And um, more particularly, it is music that is inclusive, music that is healing, music that reaches out and actually um, helps to rebuild and revive communities. And um, uh, so I'd just like for us to just sing a little bit of this last piece as we uh, say goodbye to each other. Um, I am the Rose of Sharon. I don't know how many of you know Ivo Antonini. I think he was just at uh, the uh, ACDA Nationals. But here is a Swiss-Italian jazz pianist and educator who is becoming like, I, I don't like comparing, but the next Eric Whitaker, the next uh, Morton Lauritsen, the next whatever. He, he can't keep up with the commissions that he is getting from, from all over the place. And uh, uh, he is well worth knowing. Uh, a lot of his stuff is definitely jazz inspired. And uh, this is a lovely little piece. So let's just do a little bit of it. Do, do, you, do any of you know this one? You know it. <coughs> The rose of shame. at the heart of Afrocentricity and Afrocentrism, love. Thank you so much.